so if you have a Bible, you can turn to the book of Judges. The book of Judges. We left off last week. The children of Israel have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses has died on the mountain. And Joshua leads the children of Israel into the promised land. He leads the Hebrews into the promised land. And as he leads them into the promised land, they don't get it all at once. God gives it to them uh, city by city because he doesn't want the land to overgrow. He doesn't want the people to be outnumbered. So city by city, they take over uh, the, the promised land, Canaan's land. Now, uh, the first battle that they fight is, you probably heard of, it's the Battle of Jericho. They come into this very powerful walled, heavily defended city, and God gives them some strange instructions to walk around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they're to walk around the city seven times, and after the seventh trip around the city, they're all supposed to scream and shout, and the priests are supposed to blow the trumpets, and it sounds odd, but that's what they do. And when that happens, the walls come down, and they overtake the city. And one city at a time, God helps them to overcome and to take the promised land. Obviously, there's some ups and some downs, some failures along the way because of their sin, but they eventually do inhabit the promised land. And the 12 tribes of Israel are all given their own areas of land. And God begins to lead them during this time of about 400 years now. He leads them with what the Bible calls judges. So about 450 years, the judges rule. And according to the book of Judges, there are 12 primary judges that ruled. And in the book of Judges, there is a repeated pattern. If you have read the book, you can see this pattern unfold um, throughout the book over and over and over again. And I've kind of drawn a diagram here for you on the board to, to see that progression. The people fall into idolatry. When they fall into idolatry and sin, then comes oppression, and they are oppressed by the people around them. As they are oppressed by the people around them, and that oppression grows, then in desperation, they cry out to God, they repent, God sends them salvation through a judge, um, through these 12 primary judges. When salvation comes, then it's not long, and the cycle repeats, and the people begin to fall back into idolatry, then into des oppression, then into desperation, then comes salvation through a judge, and the cycle continues over and over. There's a hint in the book of Judges that comes up a couple of times, and it is, there was no king in Israel. And that should just kind of give us a clue that something's going to change in the future uh, after this period of the Judges. There was no king in Israel. Um, I want us to look at one of the judges tonight. If you have your Bible and you're in the book of Judges, if you will turn to Judges chapter 13, I want us to look at a judge that is probably one of the more famous judges by the name of Samson. And I want us to see a few things about this man Samson. The first thing we see is in chapter 13, and we're not going to read this, but we're, we can see if we did take the time to read it together that Samson had a miraculous birth. There was a man by the name of Manoah, and this man had been married for some time to a woman that the Bible describes as barren. She could have no children. One day this woman is out, and the angel of the Lord comes to her. Now, I think we've mentioned before at some point that the angel of the Lord generally in the Old Testament is not just a generic angel, but it is generally the presence of Jesus the manifest presence of the second person of the Trinity, the, the Son of God, before He's born in Bethlehem, He manifests in the Old Testament often as the angel of the Lord. And that's the case here. Jesus comes to this woman, this barren woman, and He tells her, you are going to have a son. You're going to be oppressed by the Philistines, and you're going to have a son who will begin to deliver you from the Philistines. You don't need to drink any strong drink. You don't need to, to eat anything unclean. When this boy is born, he's going to be a Nazarite to the Lord, so he needs to stay away from strong drink, and he never needs to put a razor to his head. The woman goes back. She tells her husband about this. Her husband 
uh, in disbelief, goes to the Lord and he prays. He says, God, can you send this man back to us? I want to hear this with my own two ears. I want to hear how we should raise this boy. And sure enough, God in His mercy and in His grace hears the prayer of Manoah and the angel of the Lord appears again. Jesus comes again and He says the same thing to the woman. The woman runs and gets Manoah. She shows the angel of the Lord. She shows the presence of the Lord to Manoah and he believes. And we know that this is the Lord because Manoah offers him a young goat. And he says, I won't eat the young goat, but you can bring it and offer it to the Lord. And when Manoah offers the goat on the altar before the angel of the Lord, fire consumes that goat and the angel of the Lord goes up in the flame of fire. And Manoah recognizes we have been in the presence of God. He's going to kill us. <laughs> and his wife said, if he was going to kill us, he would have already done it. He's received the offering. Let's, let's go on our way. So they do. And sure enough, just as the angel promised, this barren woman gives birth to a son and she names him Samson. So Samson had a miraculous birth. The angel of the Lord comes and announces his birth to a woman who was barren and could not have children. The second thing, I want us to see about Samson is that Samson had the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. Samson had the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. Now we're going to find out that Samson has some trouble. Okay, And his biggest trouble is of the female persuasion. And Samson sees a Philistine woman and all he knows about her is she looks good to me. So she looked good to him and he went and he told his father, I want this Philistine woman to be my wife. And the father says, aren't there some good Jewish women that you can choose from? And Samson would not have it. But it's interesting that the Bible says that this was of the Lord. It was of the Lord for Samson to want this Philistine wife because he was going to use this to begin to deliver the people from the Philistines. So they began to make their way to get this Philistine bride, and as they do, a young lion comes out of nowhere and rushes towards Samson. And in Judges chapter 14, if you look in verses 5 and 6, look at what happens when this lion comes to him. In Judges 14, 5 and 6, Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came as far as the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Now notice this young lion is coming at Samson and this isn't some kind of strength that Samson has in himself that he catches this lion and tears it to pieces. The Bible's very specific that it was... The Spirit of the Lord that had come upon Samson that enabled him to kill this young lion. Now, he goes, he negotiates for this wife. So sometime later, Samson passes by this lion. You know the story? When he passes by the lion, he sees the carcass and what's inside of the lion. It's, bees have swarmed into the lion's carcass and they've begun to form a hive and they've put honey inside of that line. So Samson reaches down and he scoops out a handful of this honeycomb and honey and he eats it and he gets himself an idea as he goes to a party to celebrate his marriage. At this party, 30 men have been invited and Samson decides he's going to make a bet with them. And he says, I'm going to make a riddle. And if you can get the riddle right, I will provide you with 30 sets of clothes. Apparently this was a deal. Maybe they were nice clothes. But if, but, but if I tell you the riddle and you can't figure it out, then you are going to give me 30 sets of clothes. So he proposes the riddle to them, and the riddle is found in verse 14. And it says this, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. So these men began to talk amongst themselves, try to figure out this riddle. And after days and days go by and they cannot figure out the riddle, the time is coming for them to, to either to, to de 
unfold the, the meaning of the riddle or pay up with their 30 sets of clothes to Samson. So they begin to beg his wife, tell me what the riddle is. Tell me what the riddle is. Well, I don't know what the riddle is. If you can go find out the, you go find out what this riddle is or we're going to burn your house down. We're going to burn you and your father and your house down. So she goes to Samson. She begins to beg him. What is the answer to the riddle? What is the answer to the riddle? And again, we get a little hint of Samson's problems and he caves to the woman and he tells her the answer to the riddle. Now they've threatened to burn her and her dad and her home if, they, if she doesn't come back with a riddle. She goes to Samson, talks him into telling her the meaning of the riddle. And when he goes before the man, guess what? They have the answer. And it's found in verse 18. The men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a line. And my favorite line in Judges is immediately after that, when Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. For some reason, I just love that line. It's like his response. Like, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have figured out uh, my riddle. So Samson has to pay up. So what does he do? He goes down and he kills or he, he takes 30 men and he takes their clothes from them. In verse 19, look at what it says. Then the Spirit of the Lord, this is verse 19 of chapter 14, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, just like he did when he tore that line to pieces. And he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those who told the riddle. And his anger burned and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife, this is verse 20, was given to his companion who had been his friend. Now, this, this girl's father thinks that Samson is angry and Samson is gone, so he gives her to Samson's best man. He gives her to Samson's friend as his wife. Well, Samson comes back after he's cooled down and decides he's going to go visit his wife. He's going to go see his wife. He wants to, he wants to go into his wife. And when he gets there, he finds out that his father-in-law has given his wife to his friend. And Samson gets angry, goes out, catches 300 foxes, ties their tails together, sets them on fire, turns them loose in the fields. The fields catch on fire. And it's very interesting that when the Philistines find out who did this and why he did this, they came in chapter 15 and verse 6, and they burned her and her father with fire. The very thing she tried to avoid by getting Samson to tell his riddle in chapter 14 still happened in chapter 15 as a result of her finding out the riddle. They get angry and kill his wife and his father-in-law and then Samson retaliates. He retaliates and kills a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Judges chapter 15 verses 14 and 15. He's been captured by some men of Judah and they've tied him up and they've brought him before the Philistines. And in chapter 15 verses 14 and 15, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily so that the ropes that were on his arms were his flax that is burned with fire. His bonds dropped from his ha hands. He found the fresh jawbone of a donkey. He reached out, took it, and killed a thousand men with it. And Samson said in verse 16, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. Now how did Samson do that? How did he kill this lion? The Spirit of the Lord rushed mightily upon him. How did he kill these 30 men and take their spoils and take their clothes? The Spirit of the Lord rushed mightily upon him. How did he kill a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey? The Spirit of the Lord rushed mightily upon him. And the point is, not only did Samson have a miraculous birth, but Samson also had the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. The third thing I want us to see is in chapter 16... Samson is betrayed by someone close to him for silver. 
In chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, Samson went to Gaza, which again is in the Philistine territory, and saw a harlot there. And he went into her. When it was told to the Gazites, saying, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. And they kept silent all night, saying, Let us wait until the morning light, then we will kill him. Now Samson lay until midnight, and at midnight he rose and took hold of the doors of the city gate and the two posts and pulled them up along with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain, which is opposite Hebron. After this, it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. You see a pattern here with Samson. He finds a Philistine wife. This all goes south really quickly. Then he goes into a harlot. He has to escape the city. And shortly thereafter, he sees another Philistine that he thinks is attractive. And her name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, they've realized Samson has a weakness here. He may be very strong, but he's got a weakness here in women. So they came up to her and said to her, Entice him and see where his great strength lies and how we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. Then we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Think about that. If one of them gave her 1,100 pieces of silver, that would be quite the bounty. But they're all each offering her 1,100 pieces of silver to try to find out where Samson's strength lies. So she begins to seduce him and she begins to sweet talk him. And she says, Samson, if you really love me, if you really care about me, you'll tell me where your strength lies. And Samson says, okay, okay, I'll tell you. If you take seven fresh cords that have never been dried and you tie me up with those seven fresh cords that have never been dried, my strength will just melt away. So she lulls him to sleep. She finds seven cords that have never been dried. She, roll, she, she ties him with them. She, the Philistines are waiting and hiding and she awakes Samson with, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. The Philistines are upon you. And he snapped the seven fresh cords like they were nothing. Now she's offended. Samson, if you really love me, you would tell me where your strength lies. And Samson says, well, okay, I lied to you the first time. If you take seven new, if you take new ropes that have, that have never been used, just find some new ropes that have never been used and tie me with those, then my strength will melt away. So what does she do? She lulls him back to sleep. She finds ropes that have never been used. She ties him with those ropes and she says again, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He jumps up, breaks the rope, breaks through the rope like a knife through hot butter. And she apologizes and is offended. Why, Samson, aren't you telling me the truth? If you really love me, you would tell me where your strength lies. You think Samson is very slow to learn here because again she lulls him off to sleep after he tells her another supposed secret. If you just weave seven locks of my hair into a weaver's web, then my strength will leave. So as he sleeps, she takes seven locks of his head and she weaves them into a web and then shouts, the Philistines are upon you. And yet again... He's free. Finally, the fourth time, she begs him, tell me where your strength lies. He's been betrayed by someone close to him for silver. And now, fourthly, Samson is finally arrested and humiliated because he breaks and he tells her where his strength lies. He says, a razor has never come up on my head, but if my hair is cut, if my head is shaved, my strength will leave. Here's a man with a miraculous birth come to save the people from the Philistines. The Spirit of the Lord has come upon him time and time again, just when it's most needed. And now he's been betrayed by someone close to him for silver and he spills the secret of his great strength and he is arrested and humiliated. If you shave my head, I'll lose my strength. And sure enough, what does she do but lull him to sleep, shave the locks of his hair off, and in chapter 16, verse 20, she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, Man, this is just a tragic, tragic mistake. He awoke from his sleep after telling her the truth and said, I will go out at other times and shake myself free. He thinks he's been shaking himself free. 
He doesn't realize that he's not the one shaking himself free. It's God. The Spirit of the Lord is shaking him free. So he thinks he can have his hair cut off, the very thing God commanded him not to do, and he can go out and, and shake himself free as he's done before. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. How sad it is. He didn't even know that God had put him on a shelf, that God had put him on a back burner, that God had departed from him. In verse 21, the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes. Jesus said, If a man looks at a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her in his heart. And he says, If your eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life with one eye than to go to destruction with both eyes. And Samson's eyes have caused him to look at a Philistine woman. He's caused him to look to a harlot. It's caused him to look to another woman named Delilah. And now he is having his eyes gouged out. The very thing that began to lead him into this sin. They brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze chains. And he was a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. For they said, Our god has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their god. For they said, Our god has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. It so happened when they were in high spirits that they said, Call for Samson that he may amuse us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he entertained them and they made him stand between the pillars. Samson is arrested and Samson is humiliated. His eyes are gouged out. He's grinding in the prison. All of the lords of the Philistines have gathered together and they say, Bring out Samson so we can laugh at him and mock him and make fun of him. Our God is greater than the God of Israel. And our God is greater than Samson. Lastly, he had a miracle birth. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was betrayed by a close companion for silver. He's arrested. He's humiliated. And lastly, in his death, he gained his greatest victory rescuing his people. Verse 26 Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, How humbling to be this strong, mighty man. And now he's got a little boy holding his hand, leading him around like a child. He says to the boy who's holding his hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests that I may lean against them. He wants to put his hand on the columns that's holding up this building that all of the lords of the Philistines are in. Verse 27, the house was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there and about 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking on while Samson was amusing them. So this place is full. It's a stadium full of Philistines. 3,000 men and women are gathered on the roof. And in verse 28, we see Samson do something that he has not done in the entire storyline of the book of Judges. Samson him called to the Lord. And he said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O oh God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, braced himself against them, the one with his right hand, the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed in his life. Samson gained his greatest victory in his death. He rescues his people in his death. And Samson is a tragic character 
all the way up to chapter 16 and verse 28 when he called on the Lord and he accomplished the purposes that God had set forth for him to accomplish. And if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, you find out that Samson, with all of his flaws, with all of his issues, made Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith. Time would fail us to tell of Samson. It's what the author of Hebrews said. He's a man of faith. He's a hero of the faith because in the end he called on the Lord and he began to deliver his people from the Philistines. Again, this story is true. This story is historically accurate. However, there's a bigger story when we pull the curtain back. Samson came to physically save his people from the oppression that they were experiencing from the Philistines. Remember, we have idolatry, then they fall into oppression, and then in desperation they call on the Lord, and then the Lord responds by sending salvation. In this instance, they have begun to drift away, to fall into idolatry and sin, and the Philistines were the oppressors. The people are calling upon the Lord. The Lord miraculously brings about the birth of this child Samson who would grow to be a savior. He would grow to be a judge of His people and save them from the oppressors, the Philistines. But He also came to point us to another Savior who would come to save His people, not from the Philistines, not from the physical, but from their sin. In Matthew 1 and verse 21 it says, She will bear a son and you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. Let's look at the similarities real quick. Samson had a miraculous birth announced by the angel of the Lord. Jesus had a miraculous birth, not to a barren woman, but to a virgin woman. And His birth was announced by an angel. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson one, two, three times. Mightily came upon Samson. Jesus had the Spirit of the Lord come upon Him and descend upon Him in the form of a dove, but the Spirit remained on Jesus. Samson was betrayed by a close companion for silver. Jesus was betrayed by one of his very own disciples for silver. Samson was arrested and humiliated. So was Jesus. Samson gained his greatest victory in his death. And so did Jesus. Uh, Colossians 2. Let's start at verse 13. So Samson gains his greatest victory in his death, Jesus gains his greatest victory in his death. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, And He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When He had disarmed the rulers and authorities, He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him. What is is happening here in Colossians chapter 2? Jesus sees us dead in our transgressions, dead in our sin, hopeless and helpless, lying lifeless at the bottom of a vast ocean. And He comes and He takes our sin upon Himself and it is nailed to the cross. He takes the record of our debt and He removes it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And He overcomes, He overcomes the enemy. He overcomes the enemy and parades Him around in victory. He's triumphing over them in victory, disarming them, taking away the power they have over us, saving us from our sin. He puts them to open shame and triumphs over them. Jesus gains His greatest victory in His death. Samson, a very imperfect Savior of God's people, points us to the perfect Savior of all peoples. Now, do you remember we mentioned in the book of Judges that several times we read that there was no king in Israel. So the people did what was right in their own eyes, 
because there was no king in Israel. If you turn over a few pages to the book of Ruth, I want us to just spend just a minute because this is going to be a really good transition to where we're going to be next Wednesday. I want us to look in the book of Ruth. One, because this is about a woman. We've looked at Adam and we did look at Eve some. We looked at Noah. We looked at Abraham. We've looked at Moses, children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. We've looked at Samson. We haven't really looked at a woman. And Ruth is a book about a woman. And secondly, this book is written and is set in the same period of time that the judges ruled. This is going on. You've got idolatry, oppression, desperation, and salvation. 450 years. And during this time period of the judges, chapter 1 says, It came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1, there's a famine in the land. There's some oppression coming. There's some sorrow coming. There's some consequences of sin coming. And there is a woman by the name of Naomi who takes her two sons along with her husband and they go into a place called Moab to find food. Now Moab is modern day Jordan. It's across the Jordan River from Israel. They left Bethlehem, which ironically means the house of bread, to go into Moab to find some bread because there was no bread in Bethlehem. There was a famine in the land. When they get to Moab, lo and behold, her two sons marry Moabite women. These aren't Jews. These aren't Hebrews. These are Moabite women, Gentile women. They marry Gentile women, and before the story ends, her husband dies and leaves Naomi a widow. And her two daughter-in-laws... Her two sons die and leave her two daughter-in-law's widows. Now, Naomi hears that there's bread back in Israel, so she's going to go back home. She wants to send her two daughter-in-laws back to their families, but one of her daughter-in-laws insists on going with her. She said, I want your God to be my God, and I want your people to be my people. And this daughter-in-law's name, Ruth, which the book is named after. Ruth gets back to Israel with Naomi. They are in the lowest of the low state, hopeless, helpless, and Ruth is in worse position than Naomi because Ruth is a foreigner. Ruth is not a Jew. Ruth is a Gentile. And she is in the lowest of low places. She has no job. She has no income. She has no husband. She's left as a widow. She has no hope. But but Naomi sends Ruth out to glean wheat in the fields of a man by the name of Boaz who just happened to be some of the near kin of Naomi. And in the Old Testament, what would happen when a lady's husband died is the nearest kin would marry that lady. Usually, it's often a brother would marry that lady. And he would produce children for the deceased husband. And that man who did that was called a kinsman, a kinsman, he's kin, kinsman redeemer. He would redeem this woman who is left a widow, who's left childless, who's left with no income. It was an act of mercy on his part to take this woman in, to marry her, to give her children who would carry on the namesake of her first husband. And long story short, in the book of Ruth, it's a love story of epic proportions. And Boaz, this kinsman redeemer, seems to fall in love with Ruth and marry her. It's interesting that in the book of Ruth, the the root word redeem is used 23 times. Look at these four little chapters. And 23 times the root word redeem is used. And we see something happening here. It's just a story about redemption. story about a kinsman redeemer. And in this story we get a glimpse of the great redeemer Jesus because Jesus, like Boaz, came to the destitute. Boaz came to the physically destitute. Jesus came to the spiritually destitute. Boaz came to to Ruth who was hopeless and who was in a helpless state. And Jesus has come to us who are enslaved to our sin and in a helpless state. 
at incredible cost to him, Boaz marries this Moabite woman, this foreign woman, this foreign, foreign widow, and he brings her into his household and he gives her children at an incredible cost to himself. Jesus leaves the right hand of the Father and He comes to this earth to redeem sinners. Sinners who aren't just Jews, but sinners who are Moabites. Sinners who are Gentiles. People from every nation, tongue, and tribe. And in the midst of a very difficult time, a tragic story of a widow, a foreign widow, ends with a marriage and the birth of a son to Ruth and Boaz who they named Obed. This doesn't sound too important, but if you turn to Ruth chapter 4, this is where we're going to end, you see that there's more to the story. In Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron. To Hezron was born Ram. To Ram Aminadab. And to Aminadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, this kinsman redeemer. This man who took this Moabite woman into his household married her. So to Salmon, Salmon was born Boaz, was verse 21, and to Boaz, Obed, this is Boaz and Ruth's son named Obed, and we still don't care, we still don't really see what's important here, but we read on in verse 22. And to Obed was born Jesse. And to Jesse, who? David. So judges, this period of the judges, the people are doing what's right in their own eyes because there's no king in Israel. And now, during the period of the judges, this man redeems a Gentile widow and they have a child who would be the grandfather of David. The last word of Ruth. David, which points us to the most famous king of Israel, King David, who we're going to look at next week. And we're going to see the high and the low of King David and how it all points us to hope in Jesus Christ alone.